looks like I'm muted. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to our seven o'clock uh, block today, uh, our Black Love Day, a day of healing. Um, we've kind of had a long week, um, a long struggle. Um, and so we're coming together today to talk about how we can heal as a community and what that might look like in different spaces um, that Black people exist. And so um, with that, we are coming tonight to talk to um, our guests about healing after being system engaged and caged. So um, we have with us tonight a couple of uh, guests with us. And so I'm going to ask um, that they introduce themselves. And um, I'll go ahead and get started with you all um, to give your name, your pronouns, um, where you are from, maybe where you live or where you represent. Those could be the same places. They might be different. Um, if you have any organizational affiliation, if you care to share that with us, and then uh, naming the work that you do. Um, if you want to do that, you uh, may not care to share that yet, and that's okay too. Um, and then the big one um, that I'm excited to hear from our guests about, um, tell us your favorite thing that one of your grandparents um, shared with you that still stays with you today. And if you can't uh, think of a grandparent, an elder uh, community member who uh, was present when you were a child or adolescent. So um, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, I'm Shantae West and my pronouns are her and she. Um, I am from, I say I am from uh, Northern California. Um, I live in South Louisville. Um, so I represent um, Ohio, California, uh, South uh, Louisville right now. And um, I am a member of Black Lives Matters, um, the primary organization that I'm working with um, right now. And I'm uh, also a social worker. So anything um, child welfare related, that um, that's my primary area. Um, my favorite one thing that my grandparent uh, shared with me that still stays with me today, I think I shared with our guests before we came on. Um, so my grandfather, um, my paternal grandfather always had a saying, when people greet you, even you know, you should have something good to say. So even if you don't, um, if someone would say, uh, good morning, how are you doing? And I was so, so I would say I'm in the land of the living because it's a blessing to be among the living and not the dead because um, we could have been six feet under and uh, too many black people know that. So if I have nothing else good to say, I'm in the land of the living. So um, with that said, um, I want to pass it off uh, to my right as far as I'm seeing and Harriet if you want to take the floor. Hi. Thank you. My name is Harriet Rankin. No pronoun. Um, I was born and raised in Louisville, Kentucky. I am affiliated with BLM, Black Lives Matter, and I am on the cook team. Um, I've been doing that since March. Um, I'm also affiliated with uh, Louisville Community Bell Fund as far as the hotline, trying to answer some of the lines uh, when folks are getting arrested trying to uh, get them going if we have the funds to help them get out. Um, so I try to support on that end. Um, the work that I do personally, I have my own catering company and that's called Lee May Catering. So I do uh, weddings and parties and things like that on that level. Um, I've been in food and beverage for about 25 years. Um, I have worked at most of the, well, five, five of the top largest catering companies or vendors in Louisville, Kentucky, starting with the convention center. Um, I ran the convention center and banquets. I've also been assistant director at Levy's out at the fairgrounds. I've also managed Papa John Stadium, which is Cardinal Stadium at the football stadium and food and beverage. Um, I've worked everywhere. I've been at the Brown, the Sealback, um, anywhere where there's food and beverage and good times, nine out of 10. I have worked there, staffed there, or uh, done some kind of events there. 
I've also worked for a place called McClarty and Associates. I did payroll there and also staffing um, down to cooks, dishwashers. Um, I've also worked for LGC and they're one of the top uh, temp services. And I was assistant branch manager for them in staffing um, all over uh, downtown Louisville. Um, so I've had my run in the city as far as food and beverage, celebrities and et cetera for big top events. Um, and as far as uh, uh, elderly or grandparent, they've always told me, fake it till you make it and just work hard at anything and everything that you do. And just being around people general or if you want to have, you have to have a humble heart to deal with public and people in general. Because if you don't have a humble heart, you can't have compassion. You don't feel people's pain at times. So um, that's where my passion comes from, literally. Like my grandparents, they were really humble folks, worked very hard. Um, so I do get that drive from my grandparents to my parents. Yes. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I could see that. I could see that completely in you. It's in all the love and the cooking <laughs> and everything. So I picture you in the kitchen with your with your grandparents taking some of that in, too. Thank you. Yeah. OK. And we'll pass it on down the line to Mr. Shelton McElroy, the man, the legend. It's not he's not a myth. <laughs> Thank you. Uh uh, thank you both, um, Shantae and Leslie. Uh, so um, my name is Shelton McElroy. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, his. Uh, and I live here in Louisville, uh, represent Louisville, um, have had uh, the privilege to travel the U.S. and make a lot of friends in a lot of places. Uh, and in all my travels throughout the U.S., there's no place like home. Um, I've found that I, I, I love Louisville with a deep uh, part of my soul. Um, organizational affiliations, uh, I would say de definitely BLM Louisville is inside of me, and, and I act that through um, giving back to that org. Um, but it's a, it's deeper than, than, than you know an organization. It's a movement. Um, uh, there's All of Us or None uh, with Savvy Shabazz. Uh, there's a Root Cause Research Center organization that I am uh, affiliated with as well. Um, and uh, the work that I do um, is pretty much all things people that are recently released from incarceration. I, I, I try to continually make myself available to um my tribe and my tribe, I consider uh, folks that um, have uh, come out of jails and prisons. Uh, and then um, favorite thing that uh, a grandparent said, so I, I, um, I went into foster care at three years old and have never met any of my uh, biological grandparents. Um, but, but, my foster mother that brought me into her home at the age of five uh, was 65 when I came into her home. And she would always say to me, boy, you can get more bees with honey than you can with vinegar. And, um, and I'm not gonna break and tell you what that means. You gotta live it and understand it. Uh, but if you are young and you hadn't heard that yet and you, Remember, remember that from this conversation. Um, if you just repeat it to yourself every now and then, you, you'll find yourself uh, realizing the deepest meaning of what it means to be able to get more bees with honey than you can with vinegar. So thank you for creating this space, Shantae. Thank you. And you know what? So I heard a theme in all of that. I heard, you know, Harriet talking about being humble. And, you know, so maybe that sometimes um, we need to put ourselves in space of, of other people. So I think that's a good um, opener for what we're going to talk about um, tonight. So I want to start off and I want to read you all a, a statement. 
And then I want you to um, uh, kind of tell me your thoughts, but let me back up first and say this. Um, Harriet, um, I want to ask you if you could tell us a little bit of your story, just to kind of give us um, a background as much as you're uh, comfortable with sharing a little bit. Yeah, I don't have a problem at all. Um, my background is I was grow brought up with both of my parents and and I started off living a productive life and et cetera. But life took a turn for me when my parent, my first parent died. Um, I was 21 years old on my third kid. I got a sister 13. Um, my dad's a sick guy. You know, I'm going to have to take care of him. So when my mom died, I just something clicked and and I ventured out and started using drugs and done some other little crazy things to cause me to be incarcerated um, to the jailhouse, to the big house, which is penitentiary. And it didn't happen just one time. It happened two times. It didn't happen two times. It happened three times. I had to bump my head a few times, learn my lesson on where I want to go in life or what I wanted to do in life. Uh, I didn't have any uh, charges that were aggressive or anything like that. I don't mind to share bad checks. So when we talk about the system and you have written a bad check for about $500, theft by deception, theft over $500, which can cause that to be a felony for you. Theft under $500 is a misdemeanor. You're just fine. You get a pat and you go on about your business. Um, but by me being a convicted felon for a bad check, <clears throat> Oh, you go get a probation officer. You you have to go report every month. I'm young, not failing the system. I'm hard headed. I don't comply by the rules or the rules don't comply to me at this point is what I'm feeling. So I run around and I continue to do whatever I want to do in life. And I'm I'm still trying to beat the system or 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 I'm still in the system. So that means you need to be clean and sober. You have to live in a certain, you got to live a certain kind of way to be on probation. If you don't, then it causes you to go back. So when I say back is you can start from the jailhouse and go back home, or you can go to the jailhouse to go to the penitentiary. It's a process. Uh, they can call them halfways, houses, halfway back programs, you know, uh, a lot of little bit of, hiccups to kind of make you bitter and not want to even comply by the rules that the system put in order for you to be productive. Why I say that is because there's always stones that they throw at you to make you not be productive for the system that they put in place for you when you come out of the system. Um, I've had a lot of girls that had kids and different things coming through the system and that was a big burden for them which if you become friends or close with some people in the system it becomes a burden for you also because uh, a parent being behind bars knowing that you have kids at home or you're pregnant in the system where's your kid gonna go while you're in here uh, who's gonna take care of your kids while you are uh, incarcerated or when you get out where are you gonna go do you have a home placement um do you have a trustworthy family member that is not a convicted felon that you could even have a home placement to go to their home? Uh, it's, it's just a big hoopla when you do get in the system. It can be a, a lesson learned to do better, or it will break you and sink you all the way down to the ground. Uh, there's people out here still right now today that has been struggling with drug addictions and programs through the jail system to recover and regain their identity in life, some of them are still lost out here because they weren't able to complete the system. And I mean, the system with, with the courts put in place for you. A lot of people don't know that these parole officers get a certain bonus when they lock us back up on these probation violations or you don't have to commit a new charge to go back to penitentiary. You just don't have to you just have to make hiccups along the way to get a free ride back to the penitentiary. I mean, those rides are so easily to pick up, but there's not a ride to send you down the road to straighten up. Um, the system is very hard to get out of. I caught my first case 
which was my only case in 98. And it took 2018 for me to smash down a four-year sentence for a forged instrument, theft by deception, because the system kept me bonded, weak, unclear of life on a four-year sentence. It was two years for theft by deception, two years by forged instrument. And they sent me to a women's penitentiary with killers, murderers, child molesters. How can I recover when I'm devastated that I wrote a bad check? I don't get any assistance from the from the system. I don't get food stamps. I'm a single mom. Yeah, I went over on my bank account. I think that I should have been able to pay it back, which was what I'm thinking is going to happen. I didn't think it was going to cost me 20 years of my life for trying to feed my kids for writing a bad check. The system is designed to break you. Once you cross that street, you're in debt with the system forever, almost. And it took me 20 plus years. After I did my time, they still hang on to you. They still hang on to you for a little while. Um, I did have a real, real big problem that I ended up writing the mayor, the governor, and I started seeing that I was being held against my will because I felt like I had served my time. I had grandkids on the way, a new husband, and I had a new pro pro officer that wanted to be a tough guy. When you get a new parole officer, they whatever you have in that file doesn't mean anything to them. That you paid all your restitution fees on time, you've had a job for over four or five years, and you've been productive and upstanding citizen in society. When you get a new one, that doesn't matter anymore. It's like you start all over from the beginning and they work you over until they work you back in the system. So it's, it's just really, uh, it's really, uh, I don't know how to describe it. Hell, I don't know how I got out of it. Bless but, uh, it's just a journey once you get in. Like I said, uh, by the grace of God, but on that third run, <laughs> I had enough. Yeah. You know, I had enough. Um, I think that I ran because I wasn't missing anything. When I left, four months, I'm not missing a birthday. I'm not missing a Christmas. You know what I'm saying? I'm not missing Easter. So as time starts progressing in my addiction, the system starts holding me a little bit longer six months to a year. And when that year came and I started missing birthdays and Easter's and Christmases and my kids, um, most important days of their lives, I started to wake up a little bit, you know? That's where that third run, when they gave me that nice little 11 month deferment, um, I just couldn't go back again. I couldn't do that to my kids again. Um, and it took the reflection on the third go around for me to realize what I was doing to my kids, what I was doing to my my sister. She was 13 years old. I had to raise her. And now she's helping me with my kids because I'm running in and out of jail. Um, she doesn't have a mom to help support her with my kids. My dad's deceased at this time. So. Uh, I was grateful that the system never stepped in and took my kids from me because Lord knows that would have been another hurdle and cradle. And uh, But I never forget when I went up for shock probation and I had everybody in my family to write letters and all this stuff to go to court for me to get shocked out. Um, I can hear they cry. I could hear them cry in the courtroom for me to be released. And I did it again, you know, I went back again 
And I went back again after that. But every time I went back, I lost somebody very dear to me when I came out. They were not here anymore. And I remember that very last time. My granddad said to my little sister, she's going to leave you out here again. You just watch and see. And I kept telling my granddad, I said, I'm not going back this time. I promise you. And I meant that from the bottom of my heart. I did everything right that time. But I had a new parole officer that wanted to be a dick. And she snatched me up. I had two grandkids on the way and a brand new husband. And she snatched me from my family and I was doing everything that I was told at that time. When I went back that time, guess what? When I came back, my granddad was gone. But I didn't get to tell him that I didn't do anything wrong to go back this time. And I meant what I said when I said I was not going back. But I didn't get to tell him the reason why I went back. But right before he died, I called and I was checking on him. I was hoping someone would answer the phone other than him. And he answered the phone and he said, I know where you are. And I said, but I, he said, I know you didn't get to do anything wrong to go back. No new charges or nothing. He said, you get out of there. And I'm telling you, baby, stay out of there this time. Them people don't care about y'all when y'all go in there. You're going to die in that place. You go back in there. He passed away, and I didn't even get to come home to go to his funeral. So it really hurt bad. So this time when I came out, it meant something to me. I had something to prove to myself. And I made a pact with God, and I told him if I ever mess with any drugs like that again, just take me away. Because I didn't want my family to suffer and see me turn into a mess, go through the system, and drag them in the mud. Because when you get in the system, it, you're not thinking about you because you make the crime. But it destroys your family. It really breaks your family down when they have to come see you and they leave. They don't know when they're going to get to come back and see their mom again. Or you could just possibly be in jail and never get a visit. People don't get. Um, it's just horrible. The system is a mess from the inside. It's corrupted in there. It's just dirty and it's disgusting. You, you, I think one trip to jail is enough for any punishment <laughs> for any man. Um, wow. Just the conditions that you have to do and live in uh, just to even get by in the jail or even in the prison. It's, it's enough that you beat yourself to death. You've already gave yourself the lashing that you need to straighten up. It took me three lashings, but by God, I got it this time, y'all. I have been out of the system maybe 15 years now. I'm 50, (laughs) y'all. I'm 50 years old. I don't look over my shoulder anymore about the cops. I feel good now when I walk the streets because I've redeemed myself to myself, to myself. Once you get in the system, you have to deep, get deep within yourself. Uh, and find yourself looking in the mirror, find reflections, or you won't make it. You won't make it. You will waddle in that self-misery, pity, or disgrace 
that you feel and it takes you out. Some people don't recover from going in the system because like when I got out, streets were not the same anymore. They were two lane streets. Uh, things looked different. I was almost scared to cross the street and I only did a year. What about the people that do five, six, 10, seven, eight, I only did 11 month deferment and done a year and I was scared when I got to come home, like to go outside, like which way is the store or just little general things made me have anxiety when I did try to regroup in society. Like I said, I only done a year, but I felt sorry for the ones that did two plus, three plus, 10 plus, 15 plus. Your mind goes to a different mindset where it's almost not adaptable to even walk on the streets and live a normal life because you forget, you lose yourself. Bondage. When you get behind those bars, it's a total different life. Uh, and when you come out, you think different. You act different. You walk different. You talk different. And this is nothing that they taught you how to do. It's just where your mind goes when you're in solitude. Man, that was that was powerful, Harriet. And that your story, that's why we're here today to talk about healing and for people to hear what the experiences are that our community members, our brothers and sisters, our mothers and fathers have to overcome. You know, people think that, you know, it's trivial, just a year, you know, like you said, but it's not. It's so much that you have to prepare your brain for um, to be able to kind of process through that. Um, thank you. So, you know, I, I am lucky enough to be able to facilitate tonight, um, but you uh, both are giving me life. You know, I shared before we um, came on that uh, both of my parents were in prison, um, some of the toughest prisons in the United States, um, Chowchilla, um, uh, Chino, Folsom, Susanville, you know, so I understand. And so hearing your story, Harriet, man, I feel like my, you're telling a story that I can relate to and we can hear as family members, you know, what the experiences are of our loved ones, um, because my chest is tight just listening to you. Um, that's one of the reasons why I have a hard time, you know, listening to Tupac's Dear Mama. When that song came out, my mom was in prison. So to see that visualized and she was there because of crack, like you, like you talked about so many of our people are trying to feed their families. And to this day, I don't know the crimes she committed to get there. You know, I know that my dad stole meat a few times and put it under his shirt so he could bring it to us when he didn't have money to give us to buy groceries. So I, I appreciate what you're saying. And we're here um, so that you can help us to learn how to heal and to talk about the things that you need from us as your community um, to move forward. Um, so Shelton, I kind of want to throw to you if I'm, I'm hearing these ties here too. You know, you talked about um, being in another system that also um, impacts us, um, that I have a, a lot of concern about. Um, obviously, as a social worker, I tell a lot of people that um, Louisville's about 24% Black. However, 49% of the kids that we have in our foster care system right now are Black. You know, so what, what does that look like, you know, when we become adults? Um, you not only have that... Um, you know, uh, school to prison pipeline. But then, you know, like Shelton's, you said you at two years old um, became system engaged. So as much as you're comfortable with, can you share a little bit about your experiences and maybe how, you know, you kind of process to healing through system engagement 
caging or, you know, any of the impact of the systems on your experience? Yeah, thank you, Shantae. Um, and, and thank you, Harriet. Um, you know, Harriet really kind of took me to a certain place. Um, so, you know, I went into uh, the foster care system uh, at the age of three by way of my mother going into Pee Wee Valley. And so, you know, when I hear Harriet Sharon and I, and I hear you also, Shantae, talking about parents uh, incarcerated, uh, the only photograph I had as a child uh, of my mother was in a scrapbook that was um, carried from one foster home to the other. And in that photo, we were down Pee Wee Valley on a visitation and you could see the gun tower uh, behind uh, our heads. Um, and that photo was not very becoming of my mother um, because uh, in um, the women's prison, women are often denied a, a lot of the basic hygiene uh, products. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I just recall being a child carrying that scrapbook from one placement to another placement and um, and a foster parent seeing that, that photo and, and, and commenting that my mother was ugly. Um, and, and what that did, you know, to the psyche of a child. Um, so, you know, when I hear Shantae uh, folks introduce themselves as social workers, I actually cringe uh, at that terminology because it was actually social workers that perpetuated a lot of hate and violence on me and my siblings. Uh, you asked the question uh, to kind of get us started about grandparents. Well, I had grandparents, um, but social work at the time, and, and I think they still do it today, you know, but they had accelerated this race to get us into other homes. And, um, and one of the huge discrepancies that social workers don't do um, is that they, they, they don't shut the fridge. They don't uh, value the father, right? And so they don't do their due diligence in making the connection with the father to see if there's alternative placement with uh, grandparents. And, and so I just recall, um, I've never, I've, I've seen my father from afar, but I've never met him. Um, and I recall learning about him and his side of the family and, and learning about his mother and his father who are my grandparents and, um, and they're deceased. And part of, me never meeting them was directly associated with the neglect and incompetence of social workers. Um, and, 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 and I find it really interesting because social workers almost become judge, jury, and executioners of black families. If a social worker comes into a black family because of neglect or abuse, in that immediate relationship engagement, they have such power that you could never measure it. I mean, they literally can make the difference between that child going to a grandparent's house or that child going into perpetual foster care. Um, and so uh, fast forward, my siblings and I being in foster care, um, and being three black boys in foster care. Uh, and Hillary Clinton actually at the time um, had passed a proposal, a policy change in the child welfare system that accelerated termination of parental rights. Um, and so um, my, my, my mother's parental rights were completely terminated. There was re never really any kind of... Uh, system of care that would help her to reunite with us boys. Um, and, and, you know, if you're three boys, uh, I'll stair step age, right? So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm three, my brother's five, my oldest brother's seven. Uh, not super likely that you're going to get all three of those boys adopted to the same family. 
not not three black boys. And so we cycled through uh, foster cares. I mean, probably over 20 placements. Uh, I know I've gone to about 14 different schools. Um, and, you know, essentially started going, I started going into juvenile homes first of the three siblings. Um, and, 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 and that, uh, perpetuated, um, just a direct pathway to prison. I mean, literally 18 years and three months, I was literally in prison. Um, and this is after being, you know, a ward of the state for 15 plus years, and there was no accountability to the outcomes that they produced, right? Like, so the whole idea, when you think about neglect and abuse, is the whole idea is I'm trying to prevent a negative outcome for this child. However, where they call themselves preventing that negative outcome and placing me perpetuated a whole nother cycle of negative outcomes. You know, you better like, preach. Like, yeah, like I, I had actually literally never been sexually touched until I was in a foster care, right? Like, 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 and so, um, and you know, and I will, I do want to say this because I always want to give like um, kind of a holistic picture, right? So there were uh, foster parents that had dedicated themselves to the work, right? And so they poured really good principles into me. So everything you know about me, anything good you see about me actually came by way of some of these dedicated human beings, right? So I don't wanna minimize that, but I also wanna hold a system, uh, a governmental system accountable that literally ravishes black families on a, more detrimental scale than maybe even prisons and jails. Okay. Um, we hear school to pipeline to prison, but I'm, I'm telling you the foster care system, the child welfare system, the policies and the design of the entire system is so corrosive and so oppressive and destructive to black families that when we keep talking about abolishing prisons and jails and policing, we have to at minimum wrestle with this idea that we have to abolish the current state of the child welfare system. First and foremost, it is black women. The reason why you hear people say protect black women is because black women get it at every level and intersection of life. I mean, they can't go to a doctor's office and not start having hate perpetuated on them, right? If, 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 if a black man goes into prison, guess who has the responsibility of supporting that black man from the moment he enters until the moment he exits? And even after he exits, it's black women. I worked in, 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 in bail. I work in bail currently with Louisville Community Bail Fund. Guess who pays billions of dollars annually to bail bondsmen, black women, <laughs> right? And so black women get it and get it and get it and get it and get it. And you think about the boot on the neck of a black man. If it's a boot on the neck of a black man, I promise you it's a wheel, a car wheel on the backs of black women. And so, uh, you know, 18 and three months I'm in prison. And my foster mother, Virginia Rogers, who's 65 years old, she, she, she's the only thing I know as a mother. And so I call her and, and she tells me to hold on to God's unchanging hand. And um, the only visit I had got when I was in jail, I'm sitting in the, in the jail waiting to get shipped off to the Rotary Correctional Complex. And they call me for a visit. And it's my minister, my former minister, uh, Reverend Mackey. And with them is a, a man who I considered a father figure, Mr. Donnie. And they're sitting in the window and they're talking to me. And they start to tell me that they tell me that Virginia, my foster mother, is deceased. And um, and immediately I'm overwhelmed with grief. And I say, when's the services? And they said they were last week. And so... Uh, I want to get to the healing. I want to get to the healing. So I ended up, I did uh, seven years flat day for day. Three of those years I did in complete solitary confinement and segregation. We call it the hoe in prison. 
And 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 what that means is you get 23 hours complete lockdown. You get about 35 minutes of recreation and about 15 minutes of shower time. So those are the only times you leave a six by nine cell. And um, and I remember sitting in segregation the first year, and I remember watching Mama. the season change. Like I remember I had a little window, and I remember watching snow build up on the window. And then I remember the snow going away and watching a little bird carry like a piece of grass past the window. And I watched those seasons change three years in a row. I watched the sun last longer in the sky and get darker earlier. And um, and so I, 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 I get out of prison and I had lost my only mother that I knew. And, um, and I had to figure that out. I had to make peace with her, right? And so the healing came when I was able to plan a day. And she had been uh, married to a veteran. Uh, he fought in World War II, and so she was buried um, at a, uh, a, a, a at a, 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 a plot in a veterans um, cemetery. And uh, and I went down. I, I took a drive alone with my with flowers. I took a dozen flowers, and I went to where she was buried. And um, it had been raining and gloomy the whole day, but when I get to her site. The sun comes out just as majestic and beautiful as ever. And there were two little yellow birds. Never seen yellow birds in, in Louisville, in Kentucky. But they, they both were floating and flittering around. And um, and I got to her grave site and um and I made peace. And I knew in that moment that she uh, had forgiven me. And that um, everything that she had poured into me, when Harriet, you talk about your relationship with food, um, man, I, I was a bad little kid and I was always on punishment. And so I was sitting in the kitchen and she made everything from scratch, right? Everything was made from scratch. And, um, and I would pass her the seasonings. That's how I learned how to cook. I was passing her the seasonings. And, um, and now, you know, clearly when you're five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years old and a 65, 70 year old person, like they're not cool. They don't know nothing, you know. And um, and today, like I, I, I just I'm so much like her. Right. I do everything like her. Um, and, and so there's been so much killing all that stuff that happened to me in prison, the violence, the attacks the becoming a violent human being um, as a way of trying to um, uh, live in my environment. All of that, all of that has been able to be healed. Uh, and one of the epicenters of my healing came from uh, working through that relationship and that challenge. And so I, I'm grateful for this space. I'm grateful for the uh, elevation of black women in this space. Um, if it wasn't for black women, there would be no me. <laughs> so um, keep doing what y'all doing. And I, I just appreciate you having me in this. Yeah, man, you guys, and there's so many connections. I'm uh, glad to sit here and talk with you guys. I'm just taking it all in and, um, I appreciate that. I appreciate you, Shelton, also um, for calling people in these systems accountable too, because, you know, whether black, white, or, you know, whatever, that we're responsible for people's lives when we're doing the work. And so um, your story will be something that I take with me in the work that I do. Um, and I think that that's the importance of us um, having a healing fund is that we want to be able to reach out to people like your mother, Shelton, my mother, to you, Harriet, and offer those support services that these women need to keep their families together to keep them intact or, you know, provide support um, to relatives. So Shelton, you mentioned the part about, you know, paternal family. Um, I'm only in Louisville 
Kentucky because of that. So on one of the times that my mom went to prison, uh, my parents sent me to Louisville, Kentucky to come live with my paternal grandfather, you know, to get me out of the space in California where I was at. I didn't make it very long here. I was a little too slick at 16, you know, so I left and went back (laughs) and um, came back here. But some of the most important things as far as being in an environment to see things differently. You know, um, my grandparents live in Fincastle, but, you know, being that both my parents smoked crack and had been in prison, I thought, you know, they were like the Jeffersons then, you know, to come and and see how people were living. So, you know, there's different spaces and different roles for community members and family members to help all of us heal as, you know, the impacted, um, formerly incarcerated people healing, like I said, the family members or community members that are impacted by, you know, some of the things that people may do in their addiction or that they may do in their trauma. You know, so I, I have a brother now that's in prison in Ohio and one that's six feet under in the grave that spent a lot of time in prison. And so I'm really invested in learning how we heal and move forward with tangible um, actions to support people coming home. And really we're talking about abolishing this entire system where we even have to send people to these cages because it doesn't start at 18 years old when someone breaks the law, like Shelton, you talked about, like Harriet, you talked about. What does the world look like if young Harriet had resources to help care for her father? You know, what does it look like if Shelton's mother is in a supportive, you know, community? You know, for my dad, that was one of the things that did help make a difference is that they had a a sober community where it was just like an apartment complex of people, you know, trying to make it in sober living. And so he took us to NA meetings, you know, like we were part of the crew and we lived that life. And so um, too frequently, we really don't have um, those spaces available to us to um, kind of do the healing that we need to move forward. It shouldn't take us, you know, having to experience death and additional crisis and trauma, you know, for us to work within ourselves. That's where our community should be coming in before we reach those stages, because some of our family members, they might be with us today, if not for some of the stress or, you know, undue hurt and disappointment that they experience from having their family members be impacted by these systems. Like Shelton talked about, you know, what would it look like if Black women didn't spend all of this money on the cash bail system to bring our family members home, to not be subjected um, to some of the parts of the system? So I wanted to... um, I wanted to uh, ask a question. Um, I just wanted to give you guys a prompt and ask you kind of your thoughts on this. Um, So according to um, a book, it's called America's Criminal Treatment of Mental Illness. Um, The Bureau of Justice Statistics reports that 37% of prisoners and 44% of people in jail have been diagnosed with some uh, mental disorder at some point, and that at this point in society, um, jails in New York, Los Angeles, and Chicago are the three largest institutions that provide um, psychiatric care um, in the United States. So that means that we have these three cities, jails, providing more mental health care than hospitals, than residential treatment facilities, than substance abuse treatment facilities. So when you when you hear that, that jails are providing the majority of mental health treatment here in the United States, do you feel that you saw that in the system or you see that working with people who are currently impacted by the system? I wanna comment on that. you do have people come in. Um, at one period of time, I had went to see the psych doctor myself, uh, but that was uh, it was at Otter Creek. Otter Creek is in Will Wright, Kentucky, what used to be a man's penitentiary. Uh, 
and it's inside of a mountain. Uh, I, I, when we went up in there, I, I got sick. I threw up. I mean, you're like inside of a real mountain. You can see the water running off the walls. It's it's horrible. But I had went to the doctor uh, 30 days before I got moved to a different location, which was not in max security, which uh Will Wright, Kentucky, Otter Creek is a maximum security. Uh, you are in 23 hour lockdown. Like I said, if you are a class D felon, there's no way that you should be in maximum security. You do have a lot of people that have mental illnesses. And what people fail to realize, old folks are not committing crimes going to penitentiary. Young people are. So that means that's devastation, a detachment. Uh, they still have loved ones out here. They still have family and et cetera out here. But uh, you can commit some crimes being young and think it's fun and cool. But when you get behind those bars, like I said, it takes you somewhere else. Uh, you be bullied. You can be molested. All kind of stuff goes on inside of the jail. If it doesn't get done to you uh, physically, it will bother you within mind because of you seeing it, hearing it throughout the night, throughout the day. Uh, I think anybody that goes behind any bars should have some form of counseling when they come out. And I mean, same color as them, uh, somebody that can relate to them, somebody who's already walked that path before. Uh, nobody can help you if they've never been through a thing or two. You can read books. Uh, you can go to college for this. You can say that. Uh, you can say how many of things as, as far as being a professor and and these higher up people that feel like they can read the mind or adjust the mind is what I'm saying. You can't tell me how to adjust my mind or how to regulate it if you've never been through what I've been through to get. If you went through it and got over it, then I can listen to you because you can help me some form fashion. I can grab something from you that, can, that I can probably take inside of me to help me grow a step up uh, uh, to get through it. But the system, uh, mental health inside the system isn't anything but a pill. It's going to keep you nauseated where you're sick when you don't got it. And when you do get it, you sleep all day and you only get up for the child line. Mental health for any penitentiary or jail. I don't give a shit what they're saying. They're only giving you a pill to keep you out of your mind, sleep. I don't even give a shit about life itself. So whatever those three cities you are. Ask them what the procedures are that they do, meaning nobody's probably sitting down listening to your problems, giving you a solution or a scenario of which way you could probably deal with your mind, your mind. Because once you go in the jail system, you have nothing but your mind and time. And people say a mind is a terrible thing to waste. It really is. So mental health in the jail systems are nothing but dummy dope, which are pills to keep you out of your mind the whole time you have your stay there. And that's my personal opinion because I watch it happen. So Harriet, just a kind of follow up on that. So I'm looking at um, the annual report of the Department of Corrections, and they have all of these programs listed, uh, moral rec recognition, uh, therapy, substance abuse treatment programs, sex offender treatment programs, uh, thinking for a change, Willow. Um, do either of you know any people that have heavily been involved in these programs while they're engaged in the system and this, you know, um, positively impacted them coming home? Shelton, I'll let you have that one. Um, you know, man, I, I tell you, like, so, so 
to your first question, uh, the data about LA jails, Chicago jails, New York jails being the leading mental health providers. Uh, I want to also say, you know, they're also some of the leading housing providers, right? So, uh, you know, the federal government uh, ha has taken a turn on providing housing for people with limited to low income and, 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 and that housing now comes via prisons and jails, right? And so you get your mental health and your housing in prisons and jails that you can't get when you're free. Um, uh, in terms of, of, of therapy, uh, I, I want to say uh, I'm a licensed professional therapist. Um, so I've, I've spent some time in uh, uh, white supremacist halls of higher education and picked up several credentials. Um, I'll, I'll tell you that, um, you know, culturally, uh, we are different in terms to how we're going to respond to uh, white theories of mental health that have not been, uh, you know, practiced on us to see what is effective or not, right? So in, in, in the counseling, social work, higher education, they use a term called evidence-based practices. Well, evidence-based practices are only demonstrated on a very narrow field of people. That, that's how you get to the, the evidence base. You don't want it to be super broad. And generally, um, just like most medicines, they're, they're being used with a very slim demographic of people. And so, you know, when I think about the things that worked for me, uh, you, you know, like if, if you know, like you, you got a kid who didn't have a mom or dad at all from three to 18 in terms of biological parents, went to prison, went to solitary confinement, right? Like all the things that really create um, devastation mentally, um, I've been able to overcome. And, and so what I want to really, if I, if I can say anything, it's to Harriet's point, black counselors, right? So I, I came into contact with a black counselor by the name of Keith McKenzie, uh, Greater Louisville Counseling. It was in the Habern building. He's a deacon at St. Augustine's on 16th. Did you say Broadway. Keith? Keith, Keith McKenzie, Keith, Keith, hey. you know, I always be out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I had to go see him three times through the court system, but he's probably the only one that really gave a shit about anybody. Keep going, sweetie. Right. Because to your, like, like, so what happens if you, if you meet Keith, you realize for the first time in your adult life, in your black life, that like, there's a different way to engage black people. And if you use laughter and humor and you build relationships and you, you know, like just, it, and, and it works, right? And so so Keith, when I showed up at Keith's door, check this out. I mean, I guess it was 17 years ago. I showed up at Keith's door. And I showed up because I had been domestically violent, right? I was everything that everybody hated about Black men, right? Uh, perpetrator, abuser, you know, that those were the terms that would be used about me. And I showed up at Keith's door. And after about three sessions, I told Keith, I said, Keith, yep, dad, dad. I said, Keith, when I come dad back. Did that good. Wait. I said, Keith, when I come back, it won't be Daddy because I've got court ordered. It'll be because I'm gonna teach and counsel <laughs> alongside dad did of you. It good. Dad and, um, did it and I ended up doing that. I worked for Keith good. for about seven years. Um, and, and, and so, so I say that because that I want to show you good. just how he could, because of his theoretical, uh, culturally Don't competent perspective, he could hey. take a really broken, devastated human Who being and, um, and really, me. uh, give me a, a kernel me. of 
inspiration to turn my entire life around. And I think that that can be modeled and, and, and scaled for lots of people. And so the work that I do is I incorporate, I incorporate yeah, uh, a lot of mental health practices that I've learned, but I take, I take yeah, only the good stuff and get rid of all the white supremacy, bad sick. stuff. And I demonstrate yeah, it on a culturally competent level I with like people being released I from like prisons you. and jails. Um, and I incorporate it with work, right? People need money. They need resources. They need to be able to take care of their loved ones and their family members. Um, so I, I, I'm grateful uh, for the question and, and, and for your answer as well, Harry. That is, a, that was good. That was a good one there. Uh, Keith, like you said, you, you, you want somebody you can relate to. Uh, he, like you said, was black. I, I don't know what God sent me there three times. Like I said, I didn't get it right until the third time. But he had tough love for it. He didn't cut any corners. And he just let you know just exactly how it is, you know. And you, you're going to get your shit together. You're going back. You know? You're going back. And I can hear Keith saying that all the time. Man, get your shit together. You're going back, you know. And a lot of times, uh, the second time I think I went back because it saved my life. The second time. Going back sometimes can save your life when you are for self-destruction. Uh, so I'm not mad about the second time. I was mad about the third time. Mad about the third. And, you know, so, Shelton, you said something interesting. This was a good leeway into this. Um, and we'll wrap in a few, y'all, because I could keep Harriet and Shelton all night, but we're not going to do that. But this is why we do this fun. So, um, you know, one of the things that we see is that for people that are coming back into the community, one of the most positive impacts is housing assistance. So um, when people come home and they they have a place to stay and they don't have to worry about that. And I think that... Um, that kind of goes hand in hand with another thing that we see that people who come home and, you know, maybe they're married or they have a significant other or partner when they get home, that we see that those people uh, tend to do better. So are there any programs that you all are aware of as far as housing, um, maintaining, you know, relationships um, that people coming home can work with? At Shelter might have some names or lists, but when I was doing my travels, there was no one out there that were picking up uh, incarcerated folks to help them rebuild or get back up. You just had to have your own inside support group to help you stay up, which is your family and close friends, uh, to try to help network to get your job. Uh, I was just uh, just a fortunate one to have a uh, convicted uh to be a convicted felon uh, that could still prosper and be a manager and, and still do all those other good things. But uh, it's very hard for people to get jobs after that. Uh, when, when Even if it's a class D felon, once that circle has been circled, it's hard to, to, to even find a job or even housing. You know, uh, a lot of people, like I said, they in low income poverty areas even their families are on section 8 or housing authority and they're not allowed to even let people stay with them that have convict that is a convicted felon uh, so that causes the person to have to stay in the system go to a halfway house build your money up stack your money up uh, you still got to get find a job you got to go through a program while you're still working in society trying to you know build your money to, to get your own place. Uh, and sometimes that can be a hiccup and it causes people to end up going back uh, before they can even get out into society, even though they've been freed. They have no home placement. So that means you stay, you stay until you build up or until they feel like uh, you've built up enough money or however that goes. Shelton, do you want to talk about that? Yeah. I mean, I, I will say that they've come, they've, they've, done a lot better when I when I got out I was completely homeless I, I I actually was I had a I got out of prison I had a bus check to get from the Greyhound bus station in Lexington 
to get to Louisville. I, I was in Eastern Kentucky Correctional Complex when I was released. I, you mentioned um, Otter Creek, uh, Harriet. Uh, I escaped Otter Creek. I climbed a 16 foot high razor wire fence. That's how I ended up getting the three years in solitary confinement. Um, <laughs> oh I, I, my climbed, God. I climbed that fence and I ran up in those mountains and I was hid up in those mountains, me and my co-defendant, Dirty Chris. Um, and, and I was caught and I was given uh, three additional years on my sentence and, um, and, and three years in solitary confinement. But um, September the 22nd of 2002, I got released from prison and I was released from Eastern Kentucky Correctional Complex. They call it the Pink Palace because the prison is painted pink. And uh, they drove me and dropped me off at the Greyhound bus station in Lexington, Kentucky. I had about $15, a check for $15 on me and, um, and a bus check to, and, a, and, a, and a bus pass to get fr from the Greyhound bus station, a one-way one ticket to get to Louisville, Kentucky. And um, <laughs> this is like, it's crazy. I, I told you, I, yeah, I mean, I told you I've been in foster care my whole life. So I, you know, but I knew if I got to Louisville, because what I used to do when I would run away from foster homes is I would take a phone book. Uh, and I know some of you millennials, young people, y'all don't even know what that is. But I would take a phone book and I would look up anybody with the last name McElroy. And I would just random and say, hey, are you kin to me? And people would just hang up. Um, but uh um, I, I, so I, I, I was at the Greyhound bus station and I actually, instead of getting on my bus, going to Louisville, I called a guy who had got out of prison in Lexington before me and I ended up meeting up with him and, um, I got a room at a hotel because of a friend of his who he connected me to and, um, and I didn't leave the hotel. I kept coming back to the same room. I kept the key and I kept coming back to the same room. And um, I didn't realize that's called trespassing. And uh, after being out of being in prison for seven years, um, three days later, I was back in jail uh, for trespassing and uh, got out of jail uh, finally for that charge and got on that Greyhound that I had had that ticket for to get to Louisville. And I got here and I was homeless. So I went to the Healing Place. Somebody told me that I could get help there. Um, today, there are some places. So one of the places that I talk about the most is New Legacy. Gisela and Paul Nelson. I love them. Yeah. Uh, that's a great place if you're a person recently released from imprisonment. Uh, then there's also Our Lady of Promise, Ladies of Promise, and Our Father's House. Those are great places. Uh, the black community in Louisville throughout the West End has created a network of recovery places that help people recently released from prison. Um, it's complicated because they, they are not funded at all. Like the city doesn't give them a dime. The mayor would rather give uh, the police department millions of dollars to start an explorer program that turns around and rapes and molests kids. Then he would prefer giving some money to the black community that could create thriving housing options for uh, for their community, right? Um, and that's that's the the fallacy. Like we'll have this conversation, and we're talking about raising money for a healing fund. And I just want you to know that you know you're going to give your money away no matter what. You're going to give it to the government by way of taxes, and they're going to take that money. And the way they're going to help black communities or hurt black communities, they're going to create more jail cells, more jail beds more policing, more oppression. They're going to create, if you give them money for youth programs, it's going to look like the Explorer program where they harm and destroy kids, right? This is this is what they do, right? I want to be real honest and blunt with you. I want to put it right in your face because that's what, when you give them your money, that's what they're going to do with it. So you have black people that are saying, hey, we know how to help one another. 
And oftentimes, you know, you might have came into wealth and privilege um, by way of policy that was helpful for you and your community, but detrimental for me and my community. And so I just want to really encourage you to um, trust black people. Trust these black ladies. You can't go wrong with them. When Harriet talks about she's cooking, she didn't tell you that she feeds hundreds and hundreds of people for free every single day. I, and, and I'm not talking about bologna and cheese. I'm talking about soul food. Green. Come on now, Shelton. Tell them real, real food. Cornbread. Thank you. You ain't never had a piece of hot water cornbread. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> and dignity. So, so you talk. You talk about dignity. So you're you're saying that we need to serve our community members, our brothers and sisters coming home, that they deserve to be human too. They deserve all of these things. They deserve respect. They deserve to be a part of our community, and that there's an intelligence there. You know, um, I love everything you were saying. And Harriet, you might not have been on earlier this week, but I, I kind of quoted you. We had another panel, I think, on Monday, and 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 you're sailing because I heard somebody else the next day repeat the story that I told about you. So oh. you know, that's how we make an impact. And I'll tell you now the story that I told. Um, Harriet and I recently were um, doing some advocacy work. We were in uh, Cincinnati together. And, you know, so we were cooking and things like that. And I went to the store shopping and this and that. I can cook okay. You know, I'm not like, ooh, she <laughs> burning. No, you know, it'll be good in season. It'll be all right. Cool. I got a few dishes. But I thought I was going to come in here and I'm like, okay, I got to peel these potatoes. I, I got to do it like this. Harriet said, no, put that down. Look, chop these potatoes up and just do this like this. And I had to step back and I had to listen to that because she's in a space where she knows something that she's the expert of. And so a lot of times in our community, we don't let people be experts. You know, just like what you spoke to, Shelton, that we think when people don't have that book knowledge, that they don't have that credential from uh, white supremacist academic organizations and institutions, because we're not under any illusion, the people that we work for, we get our degrees from and all of that. And so we have to step aside for people in all spaces of the community to be experts. That's why we get a lot of stuff messed up, because we listen to the wrong people. Now you let me make those potatoes. It might have been a little something different. We might have been waiting a little bit longer. But Harry said, "Cut these things up." And you know what? I moved back into my role, into my space. She said, "Cut them up like this." That's what I'm gonna do. What pot you need them in? You need me to wash these dishes behind you and get stuff moving. And that's what I did to give her space to be able to do what she needs to do. So mm -hmm. what we're talking about here all this week, and what we're talking about tonight, is how. How do we connect all of us? You know, how do we get out of these petty spaces of ego and self that we are working towards a community where we're all free and it takes all of us to free each other? So we all have different uh, strengths and different capacities, but it takes all of that. So there's no one person that's more important um, than the other. So I appreciate you guys so much in this space. I appreciate the work that you all do. You know, I will say, you know, giving you guys a shout out, just like, you know, Harriet didn't speak to it, but she's part of the um, cooking team that, like Shelton said, provides hundreds of meals, you know. Oh, I week. forgot to tell you, Shelton has pulled me into some of his world. Uh, Shelton has been getting the elderly from and to even getting them registered for the vaccine shots. And I've been piggybacking with him. Um, so Shelton, thank you for letting me be a part of that. Uh, just to be around some monarchies uh, that know something. Anytime I get on that bus, I learn something. Uh, just the spirit of being around monarchies, older folks, people who are laid back, settled, uh, 
they always got something wise to say. So just for me being able to be in that space of people that are 80 plus, I just pray that I get to make it to their age Amen. Uh, and have, have the spunk that they do and, and the grace that they do. So yeah, Shelton, I appreciate you for letting me rent that space with you. Um, yeah, no, you gotta it's, love it's the old you. people, man. I love them. The elderly people are awesome sauce. So Shelton, yeah, he's been running nonstop trying to grab any and everybody over 60 years old, all in the West End, wherever he can find some folks to get them to a vaccine shot uh, or get them to a location. If they don't have a phone or a computer to get registered, he's got that. He's doing it or he'll hand it over to me and I've been trying to help. And then that also opens the door for black market. I've been talking to the elderly to get them on the list so they can get some of this community free food and get some of these hot meals that we have also to provide uh, to our elderly. So hey, the network system, it's working. Um, if we just keep these dots, keep connecting them, man, we can build something. I'm telling you that it's just incredible. Yeah, thank you. You guys are awesome. And so I'm going to I'm going to let Shelton, if you would um, just have a word to kind of carry us out of the space about what we need to be doing moving forward. Um, you know, what um, policy types, what laws do we need to change? What supports do we need to put in for our brothers and sisters that are formerly, currently, future incarcerated, unfortunately, and the families and communities um, that are impacted? How do, how do we heal and move forward? Yeah, yeah, I, I really appreciate you pitching me that question. So, you know, one of the things- Dada. Black healing is not void of That's expressing and keeping pain and tragedy and difficulties Dada, in front of cake? us, right? Dada, can I have some yes, in one can second. Some yes, in one second. So one of the things like, you know, for black people, we don't we don't have to hide Breonna Taylor's death to move forward. In fact, we like to keep it present and in front of us because it empowers us. It tells us where the North Star is. When no more black sisters are destroyed by oppressive police, by prison systems, by child welfare systems that destroy, by educational systems that neglect and destroy our people, Right, so we're gonna keep Breonna Taylor in front of us. That's healing for us. It's not the opposite. It's therapeutic for us to know where the pain is. This is the pain. And we keep it in front of us. And we say, oh my God, not today. And we keep on trucking, moving forward. And so the policies that we need to make black life thrive. Clearly we can't have police kicking in doors, killing us. And the, the, the fact that we're asking for that as a policy prescription is unconscionable. It tells us that black lives doesn't matter. The fact that we try, we're trying to get a policy to make it illegal to have our doors kicked in and us murdered in an instant. At the minimum, give us a bit of awareness. Knock on my door before you kill me is what the policy is asking. It's unconscionable that in the very country where our ancestors toiled in cotton fields, we are disproportionately murdered by white people. Riddle me this, if the nation state of Germany police department were disproportionately murdering Jewish people, everybody 
would be up in arms about that. We would not take it. Why? Because the history of the German people and the Jewish people. But in America, we too have a history of enslavement, of black bodies being sold like cattle. Yes. Why are we fighting for a policy to make you have to knock on my door before you kill me? That tells you we have not made it very far in America. Not at all, not at all. We need a cultural change in America that's bigger than any policy could ever prescribe. Come on. We need a worldly change where human beings recognize the value of black people. We are not here to simply entertain you. You can't be a University of Louisville fan and then put on a pair of handcuffs and go out and slam black bodies onto the pavement. Or be a judge and slam a gavel and send the black man away for 25, 30 years for something that you give one of your white colleagues, sons, two years deferment. Now, this criminal punishment system, I like what Brian Stevenson said. He said, you know what? I want you, judge, to treat my black 17-year-old client like he was a 50-year-old CEO of an organization. <laughs> Give him that same kind of justice. You know how the, the white judge will say... <laughs> I don't want this to ruin your life. <laughs> like We're going to give you another chance. He didn't, want, he didn't want it to ruin my life. He told me, he said, you a menace to society. <laughs> Stop. So we need a cultural change, Shante. I wish I could tell you that there was a policy. But what policy, if you get a no-knock, is going to stop a white doctor from not prescribing a black sister the proper medications causing her to have a miscarriage. You see what I'm saying? It's, it's bigger than a no-knock policy. Black women are, the, are, 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 are dying in childbirth. Why are they dying in childbirth? Stop. They're dying in childbirth because of medical neglect. Black human beings, I got black cousins that are on the donor list right now. There's a book out called Good for Harvesting, Bad for Planting. So what that suggests is they will harvest your black organs, but they won't put none in your body if you need them. We need a holistic global change. Thank you. Thank you, man. So tonight, you guys have been super powerful. I Again, I appreciate you guys both being here. We appreciate you all being vulnerable with us tonight and sharing your stories with us. So as a community, we can learn how to move forward. So thank you to everybody who was with us tonight. Again, you know, you'll see Harriet and Shelton out in the community um, helping other formerly incarcerated people with the Louisville Community Bail Fund, all of us or none, the Black Lives Matter Louisville Cook Team. Um, you know, we appreciate y'all. So thank you. This has been a beautiful week and we're going to close it out tomorrow night and just wrap everything up. Um, so, you know, send us some love. We're trying to support Black Fems, making sure that people are getting healing. So we'll share the link with you here. Send us the dollar. Send us the dollar so we can do some of the work. You know, a lot of people ask us for receipts. You're seeing receipts right here in front of you. These are the very community members and people that we are impacting and that are helping to carry forward 
those impacts in our community to other people who are just coming home and that are hoping not to go behind bars. So thank you so much. And we appreciate you all. You guys have yeah, a good night. Before we hang up, we had one decent, good question, um, and there were some horrible trolls in the in the comments. But I did see that. Okay, uh, I didn't see Scott, that. Scott Wigginast, I believe I'm pronouncing it right. Scott Wigginast asked uh, what reforms needed in social work programs. So, wow, you know, like you avail. And so, the first thing I want to say, Scott, is that uh, social work. Um, is almost like the American dream, right? It, it's 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 what we aspire to, but you know, America was founded on slavery. So social work, oftentimes we neglect the story that the whole house, the founders of social work uh, were designed to help immigrant families. They were not designed to help black people. Black people could not go to the whole house and get help. So we have to we have to start with that history to recognize how we continue to perpetuate hatred and violence on black people, right? And so the same way America has to reckon with their history around enslavement and recognize that we are hoping to aspire to an American vision, but we haven't arrived. We haven't arrived. That's what social work has to do. First, they have to wrestle with the origins of what they it's like. Like, check this out. White men decided that the women rights, the women's suffrage movement needed uh, to have white women employed. White women were going to start working out of the home. You know what rich white men said? OK, white women, take this philanthropy money and go fix other people. That's the origin behind social work and nonprofits. Guess what? They still act the same way. That's how they were designed and that's how they still act. You meet almost any white CEO woman of a nonprofit and they will act as if their white husband gave them a check and said, go fix black people. Because that's what they originated out of. They're not doing that by default. They were organized and created to act as such. Philanthropy, very much the same way. So, so white people initially were to fix the immigrant white people, right? The, 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 the Italians, the Irish. You know, we're right now that y'all, a lot of y'all white folks are talking about uh, St. Patrick's Day. And it's funny because on the tops of courthouses, it used to say no dogs and no Irish allowed. Yes, so, indeed. Yeah, 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 yeah. So look, check this out. Check this out. Guess what? The reason why in America, you don't hear... Yeah. You don't hear Irish people speaking Gaelic in America <laughs> because your Irish grandparents told you don't go out of this house and speak that language because you would get beat up in the streets. Police would brutalize you. So you lost your Irish heritage to become white before yeah. you were white. You gave up your potatoes. You gave up your dance. You gave up your music. You gave up your language all to become white. And now you want to be celebrating St. Patrick's Day. But you forget the history that you lost your Irish heritage when you became white in America. <laughs> you feel me? Man, why, why did they start this? Why did they start this? And, and they rap. So I, I'm my one little piece. I'm gonna say that um, to answer Scott's question, um, being above board. I guess I'm. One, I'm gonna say people like me are the answer because um, I teach actually at U of L. So you use that for an example. But what it looks like is putting black women like me in the classroom and letting us say what we need to say 
to show real experiences of what's uh, going on in the community. So one of the um, complaints that I've gotten from students that I've heard about is Shantae makes us go out in the community too much. I don't I didn't go to school to do that. Well, I don't want any social worker that's scared to go to the West End and I don't want to create any social workers to perpetuate the feeling of there's some place that you shouldn't and couldn't go. We have a lot of people that come into social work that they want to be therapists and, you know, they don't want to uh, do the social activism and, you know, look at the code of ethics and what we are bound to do. And so you put people in the classroom that confront that idea of that you're coming here to only take from the community. Our job is also to put into the community and to understand that history before we go in, you know. So unfortunately, I have some students that'll say, Shantae, I'm scared of you, you know, because I don't go in the classroom to play. We're here to learn. And I take it very seriously that you will have your hands on my community and my people. And being very being black is very important to me and the way that other black people are treated. We're all family. And so if we have these people coming into these communities as educations of higher learning, we have a commitment to appropriately prepare students and not coddle them and not make things comfortable because they give us a few dollars to give them education and information because we're not really educating them or informing them if we protect them and keep them in a cocoon. You know, I said, um, I, I, you've got to bring the community in sometimes. You know, Chanel's come uh, and been in my classroom. And one of the things she said, uh, we immediately got in hot water. Chanel's so tired of me telling this story. But uh, when she left, one of my students said, she's racist and Shantae's racist too. Because one of the things, first thing Chanel said was, I don't trust white people. And we can't have social workers that a black person makes a statement like that and they don't understand the oppression and the history that that comes from. Like Shelton said, the whole house wasn't created in Chicago for black people. Ida B. Wells was a social worker, but they didn't call her one. And so we have to move away from title protections and things like that that keep black people out of the space because that's not what their title is. So Harriet, just like you said, the work that you do sometime in the community, you don't have a specific, a specific title from academia that says that, but you have an expertise that's needed. So Shelton, did we have any other questions in the chat before we check out here since I can't see that? So, 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 so we do, but most of them are from trolls. What, what, okay. what I do I do want to take um, a second because I kind of I kind of opened up a can of worms when I started talking about um, whiteness, and so I do want I, if I can just take a second to kind of finish up on that thought because I wanna I wanna honor uh, some of the white folks that are walking in the in the in the legacy of those white folks that joined us on those buses that got blown up in Alabama, right? I want to honor that. But what I want to talk about real quickly is say whiteness is an artificial thing. It's not real, right? It never existed. You came to this country as indentured servants. You Come were on, Irish. Man. You were Italian. You were Scottish. You were a Dutchman. And you were at the bottom of the class system. You worked for free. You were in the same field as the 20 Africans that came over in 1619. And you had no higher ranking. You were in the same bag. And so what happened is, is there was a coming together of the working poor. And, and, and that's what we're gonna have to have today. There was a coming together of the working poor. There was no such thing as whiteness at the time. You were a Scotsman, a Dutchman, an Irishman, and we were African. And guess what? We had grievances with the people that owned the land that took our labor for free. And oftentimes, if you're from Appalachia, you would know this. 
We ran away from Jamestown and we hid in the hills of Appalachia together. And we thrived and we knew that we were bonded together because we had the same conditions. And those same people that made money off of our labor came up with a new design and they made it so that you would become white after you completed your indentured servanthood. And that was how they separated us and how they duped you and convinced you that you were better than us because they took your labor and they made you buy into this trick, this artificial identifier that said that you were white. And so current day, we run around with these labels of who we are and we don't actually know where they came from. How did you become white if you were a Scottish person, if you were a German? How did you lose your nationality? Because they made you lose it. And now we need you to remember that history. Because if you remember that history, you'll unify with us and tear that whole racist system down with us. So thank you all for being in this audience. Thank you for asking powerful questions. Thank you, Shante, for designing this space. Thank you, Harriet, for your truth, your experience, the sweat that you give day in and day out in this community for this community. Thank you. I'm here Thank to you. follow y'all's lead. Thank y'all. Thank you. Let's get it done, y'all. I'm empowered. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody out there, hit up that fund. We've got it. Bitly slash Black Femme Healing Fund. And we're out, y'all. Good night. Thank you.